Um, hope you all are having a better day than I am. My day has not been very wonderful. I had a uh, eight o'clock car inspection due. Got there and the daggone my car didn't fail inspection. I wish you all better luck than mine today anyway. And then I have been to Lynchburg to take somebody to the airport and back. So I've had a busy day, but um, hopefully we can um, go through this class without any problems and uh, do just fine and get, get ourselves a little bit closer to the weekend. So um, is there anybody in here who did not get the PowerPoints from last Tuesday? was here Tuesday. All right, and let me pass the roll around here. Almost the end of January. Next time I see you, it'll be February. All righty, well, Tuesday we got started on our chapter about diversity and cultural diversity. We talked a lot about um, things that made us similar and different from each other and how we want to be able to communicate with cultures across the world these days. So uh, we'll pick up there. I think we have two more subjects to look at and that is diversity as far as gender goes and diversity as far as age goes. So I'm going to get to my PowerPoint slides for you and uh, we will take a look at what's left out of the PowerPoints. Got a couple more videos to do. And then the last thing we have to do today is to talk about the fact that next week is test week. So we need to make sure everybody is okay with that. So we are still in week four. We are um, looking at the PowerPoint slides which I had pulled up, but unfortunately they did not um, come up on the screen there. So let me share that a little bit better. <coughs> and we are way on down here talked about how we are perceived by other nations and how we perceive them. But I think we had gotten down to um, gender egalitarianism. So um, <clears throat> this is a very big topic when it comes to uh, cultural diversity because Dr. Henderson. Moving. Yes. Um, all we see is just the first page of the slide. Oh dear, okay, let me. Um, let me try again with the sharing. Having difficulty. Get rid of this. Try again. Okay, let's try sharing. Share screen.
What you see now? We got it. Got it. Okay. I'm going to leave it like that instead of going to the um, larger versions because it seems to lose it when I go to that. Okay. As I was saying, this is an area where we see a lot of cultural differences. And this is how different genders are perceived in different nations. Uh, this is the division of roles between men and women. Of course, here in the United States, we've seen changes throughout the history of the United States as to how um, women are perceived in the workplace. Uh, but we've gotten to a point now where we definitely see um, lots of improvement as far as uh, women holding positions of uh, leadership in the workplace. We've seen a lot of uh, traditional roles. Uh, now those lines are broken down. Uh, things like uh, nursing that used to be predominantly female, we now see both men and women in those jobs as well. Unfortunately, this is not the case in a lot of other cultures. So we have to be aware of this when we do business with other nations. So um, countries that have high gender egalitarianism are uh, going to provide equal opportunities to men and women. Uh, they have expectations of men and women to communicate the same way and to have uh, similar management styles. Uh, they do not um, draw attention to the fact that one person is a female and the other person is a male. Those that have low gender egalitarianism um, clearly offer more opportunities to men as far as leadership go. Uh, they also um, expect men and women to be traditionally either masculine or feminine in their communication ways. And they do use protocol that draws attention to whether someone is male or female. And of course, you know, we, like I said, we've seen a lot of uh, breakdown in the past uh, of some of this low gender egalitarianism in the United States. We are certainly not perfect. There are plenty of areas where there are still um, places where women are not allowed to um, be leaders in the same way that men are, but we're, we are trying to do away with that. So I have one video I'm going to show you about gender egalitarianism. You know, I felt like I had some um, gender problems today when I went to get my car um, inspected. And while it is true that um, I do, I'm not uh, an expert when it comes to automobiles, um, I did feel like perhaps I was taken advantage of a little bit because I was female and I am going, this was a new place that I went to to get my inspection done and I met up with a friend of mine afterwards, a male friend who said, um, that place has a reputation for ripping off people. So before you go get the work done, have someone check it out to make sure you really need to have that work done. So what a bummer, um, maybe just my perception, okay, that, um, <coughs> that the um, situation had to do with my gender, but I don't know, any of you other females ever felt like when you went to places like that, that you were being um, maybe taken advantage of? I, I see some nods from some people. If you, if you aren't, that's wonderful. You must be dealing with the right types of people. But I unfortunately have come across some that I clearly know that they um, don't think that I know what I'm doing. And I don't know a lot about automotives. I'm the first to admit that. However, I do know when I'm getting ripped off. So um, I have to be a little bit more cautious probably. OK. 
Okay, so we're going to take a look at the video here. Let's see if I can get to that with you all have, without having any problems here. See how our sound is, first of all. Have you ever worked with someone of the opposite sex and wondered, what on earth are they thinking? It turns out that men and women's brains work very differently. And if you know these differences, you can have them. My name is Vanessa Van Evers, and I'm an investigator at the Science of People, a human behavior research lab. In this video, I'm going to share some fascinating facts about gender intelligence. and Richard Nesbitt wrote a fascinating book called Results at the Top, Using Gender Intelligence to Create Breakthrough Growth. And they found that men and women actually think <coughs> Men tend to be more factual with their thought and action, and women tend to be more intuitive. Where do you fall on this diagram? Do you like logic, facts, and numbers? Or do you like emotions, feelings, and intuition? A lot of this has to do with how your brain processes. For example, here are two scans of a man and woman's brain at rest. Notice how a woman's brain is far more active at rest. This is why women tend to want to talk after a hard day to process, while men want to process in solitude. Women want to talk it out, process, and explore. Men want to give their brain time to explore, unwind, and decide what to do next. Neither of these approaches are right or wrong, but they are different. Why women remember everything. Why do women remember everything? This is because women have a larger hippocampus. This is where we store memories, and it's why women can recall every single word of an argument five years ago. Let's look at some of the other facts that might help you understand your opposite gender colleague, partner, or friend. Special note, the facts below are tendencies, not rules. There are always exceptions to findings, but they do help us understand how each gender tends to think, behave, and act. Fascinating fact number one, details, details, details. Have you ever noticed that men and women typically share and present differently in meetings? This might have to do with the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex, or PFC, this is the decision center of the brain that controls social behavior, judgment, and consequential thinking. Some interesting differences between men and women and their PFC. Women develop their PFC at a younger age, which is why they take less risks as teenagers than males of the same age. Women also have a larger PFC. Men have a larger amygdala, which means men can have more processing power for threats while women have more processing power for details. I had a few major aha moments while thinking about this fact. First, women will often include more details in their decision making, and they'll verbalize those details during meetings or in conversations. This is often misinterpreted by males to mean that women's deliberations take more time. But this is actually only a difference in processing. So ladies, you like to verbalize and that's okay. Men. Be patient while your ladies verbalize. That's how they are wired. Second, men and women problem solve differently. Men tend to define and clarify a problem and then begin by eliminating and isolating issues. Women, on the other hand, will often define a problem in broader terms and allow for a wider range of potential factors before going into solution mode. This is why women want to talk out problems and men want to dive right into solving them. So men, process with a woman first, then go into solution mode. Ladies, if you're with more men, quickly process or do it on your own and then move into solution mode. Fascinating fact number two, worry words. Do you know a woman who worries a lot? Don't blame her, it's just her brain. This all comes down to the worry center of the brain anterior cortex, where people process emotions, arrange memories, and ruminate, 
also known as the worrywart center of the brain. Some interesting differences between men and women's anterior cortex. Women have a larger anterior cortex, which means they spend more time ruminating, trying to process emotions, and well, worrying. Women have higher rates of anxiety than men. Researchers think this might come down to the highly sensitized female anterior cortex. Here is the aha moment I had while looking at this fact. In meetings, women are far more likely than men to read facial expressions of people around them, take the emotional temperature of the room, and be sensitive to people's feelings. This can benefit them. They might notice more, but it also could hinder them. They notice too much. In other words, a woman's heightened sensitivity is a gift and a curse. A woman's anterior cortex can give her great awareness and insight, but also can bog her down with decisions and distract her from effectiveness. To women who worry, be patient with yourself. Use it as a gift. To men around worrying women, be patient with them and find a way to leverage it. This also affects men and women in conflict. Men tend to depersonalize and externalize issues or problems, giving them time to think through solutions, often in solitude. Women tend to personalize problems and are more inclined to want to talk through the issue to reach understanding. I know for a fact that this fact gave my wonderful hubby an aha moment. Babe, this is why I constantly take things personally and want to talk them through for hours. It's not my fault. It's just my brain. Fascinating fact number three, webs versus lines. The brain is divided into two hemispheres. The right brain, which uses more creative and intuitive thought, and the left brain, which is for linear and logical thinking. They are connected by something called corpus callosum, a thick bundle of nerves connecting the right and left side of the brain. Some interesting differences between men and women. Women's corpus callosum is 25% larger than men's. This means that women tend to bounce back and forth between feelings and facts very easily. Men like to think in steps, processing one fact at a time. In other words, men think in straight lines, whereas women think in webs, constantly connecting ideas. This gave me a huge aha moment. Men's linear thinking is not better or worse than women's web-like thinking, but it is extremely helpful to know. Men are exceptionally good at focusing, getting rid of extraneous data, and pushing full steam ahead. Women are incredibly good at holistic thinking, contextualizing ideas, and drawing new connections and factors. We should leverage these differences with people in our lives. Need help with the big picture? Ask a woman to brainstorm. Need help setting up a system? Ask a male colleague for help. Remember, there are some women who are still great at systems and some men who are great at brainstorming. This is just some of our brain's tendencies that we can leverage. Fascinating fact number four, success and failure. Testosterone is the principal male hormone. Men have way more of it than women, but women have testosterone too. In fact, the way testosterone acts in the body points to some interesting gender differences. Some interesting differences between men and women. Men produce 20 to 30 times more testosterone than women. Men need to replenish their testosterone levels to feel successful and feel terrible when their testosterone levels are low. Although women and men both have testosterone, it's processed differently in stress responses. Here's the big aha moment. When men feel successful, they have lots of testosterone. When they experience a setback, they lose testosterone. This means that they need time to replenish their stores after a loss or failure. This is why men tend to need space after a long, hard day. Unlike women, men often do not immediately seek out social support or need to verbalize their thoughts. Here's what researchers Annis and Nesbitt had to say about this. Quote, this dynamic also defines some of the reason why men will often ignore a difficult problem. Avoiding the issue or shutting down gives them time to think of the issue, oftentimes in solitude. This allows men to recoup and replenish their testosterone levels and gain the mental strength and drive to tackle the issue. 
women might misinterpret a man's shutting down as avoidance or standoffishness, but actually they're getting their chemistry right so they can process. Men, give yourself time to rebound after a setback. Women, be patient with men who need some time to process. Fasting in fact number five, effectiveness. Oxytocin is the chemical that helps us feel social attachment. It's incredibly important for our social interactions. Both men and women produce and need it to connect. A lot of oxytocin means there's more trust and rapport between people. Some interesting differences between men and women. In both men and women, oxytocin reduces blood pressure and feelings of fear. In women, oxytocin can rise during a relaxing conversation and fall in response to feeling ignored or abandoned. Men also need oxytocin to lower their stress levels. However, too much oxytocin in men actually reduces testosterone levels and increases <coughs> their stress. Wait, what? Here's the aha moment. Men need a balance of oxytocin. If they've had a stressful conversation, they often seek solitude or time alone to replenish and regroup. This means, ladies, never force a man to talk it out if he's not ready. On the other hand, men can help a woman who is feeling stressed by talking her through the difficulty and letting her process her emotions. Fascinating fact number six, stress response. As humans, we produce cortisol when we are stressed. This is natural and good for us. Cortisol helps stabilize glucose levels and regulates metabolism and blood pressure. But too much cortisol for too long is bad for the body. In fact, too much cortisol can slow down cognitive performance and make it hard to think clearly. Some interesting differences between men and women. Studies have shown that women's cortisol levels are two times higher than men's at work. Women's cortisol levels are four times higher than men's at home. When women are not able to process or collaborate with others, they do not produce enough oxytocin. This makes it difficult for them to recover from stress. Here's a big idea for this fact. Women get into bad stress cycles where they cannot recover. Quote, when women aren't able to collaborate at work or there's not enough time to attend to personal life events and needs, their stress and anxiety will increase beyond their ability to relax and collect themselves. That increase in stress is brought on by the rush of cortisol that stimulates the production of testosterone in women's systems and inhibits their ability to produce oxytocin, thereby perpetuating the stress cycle. Remember that women recover differently than men, but both genders need to have time to recoup after a cortisol-inducing event. Men need time to help them process. Women need someone to help them. Just knowing these facts can help you help the people in your life and yourself. My goal with this video is to help you feel better about our gender differences. They are good. We have to have different strengths and weaknesses on a team in a partnership or in a friendship. They also help us understand and predict the behavior in our fellow human beings. Remember, we are wired differently and that's great. Do you work on a team with both men and women? Send this around or watch together in your next meeting. You can have heated discussions about whether you agree or disagree to learn more about each other's work needs. If you like this video, please give it a like and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching. To me, that just answered so many questions about the differences between men and women. And it's not just perceived, it's true biological differences that make us the way we are. Notice that she was really, really careful to say that one was not better than the other. What we're doing is just recognizing there are differences. Men need time to, to process by having solitude. Women need time to process by communicating with others. And again, you might be the exception to the rule with this, but I think, wow, I'm just absolutely that way. And I think about today, okay? Remember I came in and told you my story about having my car fail inspection. Mm -hmm. 
What was I doing? I was processing by socializing with you all. Men, on the other hand, might have said, oh, my car failed inspection. I want to go away somewhere and think in solitude about how I'm going to handle this. Let's, and they'll get right to the point. I need to do X, Y, Z to get my car to pass inspection. Okay. Um, that was clearly an example of me under stress and trying to process everything by socializing. It's not necessarily that I, I didn't hear anybody give me any bits of advice, uh, but just by verbalizing it with other people, I was showing my female tendency to process information. So maybe you find yourself that way. Now I can point the finger at cortisol, which I've had doctors tell me they can walk, because I am diabetic, they can, they can monitor my cortisol levels and tell when it's going to affect my blood sugar. So cortisol is my enemy. And I already have four times more than you guys do with it. So it's not just the fact that I'm a woman and I'm, I'm a worry wart, like they said. There are biological reasons behind that, okay? So I think for the takeaways for this class, what you have to be aware of is to look around at the setting you're in when you're trying to communicate at work, okay? If you're communicating with people that are of the same gender as you, then they are going to probably process information the same way you do. But if you're working with a group of people that are um, predominantly the other gender, then you may have to, to stop back and real, step back and realize that those people are going to process differently. And of course, if you have a mix of genders, then you're going to have to dictate to both. You'll have to realize that not everyone's processing things the same way you do. Just because someone is uh, not being verbal, they may actually still be processing in solitude. So um, just to me, that was just an amazing, I'm not much on uh, biology or human anatomy or anything, but it just really broke it down for me to understand uh, what's different between men and women. The old saying, what is it? Men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Is that women are from Venus, men are from Mars or something? We are truly biologically different. So did anybody see yourselves in any of those videos? Yeah. Are those, yeah, you men? <laughs> <laughs> I, heard, I heard some men voices there. Do you process in solitude? Or maybe you saw your partner and you go, oh my, that's why my other half behaves differently. Well, it's, it's kind of funny that this video put everything in a very scientific, biological standpoint because I've, I've literally always said that men's brains and women's brains are wired different to the point where, like, in a woman's brain, think of it like a, like a filing system almost. Everything, every filing cabinet is connected to the other. So when you pull one filing cabinet out, it pulls all of the others with it. Especially but men's... All of ours are divided very separately in far distant corners of our brain. So that way when we open one, we're very careful not to touch anything else. And we have one box, one box in the middle of the room that has absolutely nothing in it because we like nothing. <laughs> we have to sit there in a chair and not do or think anything. Yeah. Oh. I've literally always said that. Wait, wait, wait. Let me get you on the screen so they can hear you. Hold on. Okay, we got a comment from the woman back here. In the far corner back there. Go right ahead and say that women brains are like spaghetti. Yeah, I watched a TED Talk about this. Here's what they're saying here. She described it as women's brains are like spaghetti where everything kind of just mingles together and it's kind of crazy and one thing goes to another and men are like waffles that have their own little blocks and they have more blocks than other and 
Oh, men's brains are like waffles. Okay, little spots for everything. That's a good little analogy. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, I, I just think I wish I had known all that when I was younger and first started off in marriage and in the workplace. There's so many things that are different between us that I just didn't understand at all. And now that I see that, it just makes it so much easier for me to look at things from the other person's perspective and know that it's not them being rude to me or insensitive or anything like that. It's just that we are wired differently as you all said. So hopefully you gain some things from this. Again, remember one is not better than the other. Uh, what we've talked about in this chapter is that uh, by having diversity, we actually get better results than we do if we all were alike. So we're um, having diversity as far as gender works the same way. Anybody have any questions about that? Any more comments? Pretty good little section for us to look at, I think. All right, let me get back to the PowerPoint slides. Hopefully I can um, see what we've got here. Okay, did you guys get PowerPoints over there? Yes, ma'am. It does it say building and maintaining cross-cultural work relationships? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. All right, so we know that we are different. We're different. Um, in many, many different ways. So how we're going to make that work in the workplace is that we want to learn how to trust other people and show empathy. Empathy means you, you, you understand what they're thinking. Okay. So now when I have um, conflict in the workplace between someone who is from a different country or a different um, gender than mine, I can understand where they're coming from. It doesn't mean I have to agree with them, but I do show empathy. I also means I can learn from them. Once again, approach everything from the learner mindset. What can I gain from this conversation, this workplace uh, task or whatever? And if you show that you want to cooperate and use that blend of different cultures and um, attitudes and processing and whatever to help with innovation you'll definitely be better off establishing trust look at some of these rankings here about the perceptions of trust high trust societies interesting china's up there okay versus low trust the French, Mexico, Spain, South Korea, they don't trust people too much. Okay, how about fair play? If you have a high expectation of fair play versus a low expectation, uh, Japan's up the top, China and the US, okay, but down on the bottom, look at that, Germany only 1%. They don't expect people to play fair. They got some kind of hidden agendas and so on. All right, so with that learner mindset, uh, you can expect that members of other cultures will have their own unique types of knowledges and approaches, but you can share them with each other, okay? That judger mindset the opposite of it is called ethnocentrism, okay? When you are ethnocentric, that means that you think your culture is superior to somebody else's. Your way of doing things is the right way. That's not what we want in the workplace. We want you to be real, uh, to realize that things get done differently by different cultures and that we can take the information from all the cultures and actually do a better job at whatever our work task is. So stay away from ethnocentrism, OK? 
Okay. Okay, this just gives you some information about um, Brazil, um, Brazil's etiquette and customs. Um, that shows you how they are different than they are in the United States, especially. Uh, we looked at some of these in that uh, surprising differences video that we had on Tuesday. In Brazil, it's okay to talk about personal topics, especially okay to talk about soccer. We know they are really into that, okay? Okay to talk about the weather, traffic, cultural events, but do not talk about politics, poverty, crime, corruption, that type of thing. Just don't even bring it up. Okay. Now I kind of agree on the politics. I don't like to have a lot of uh, heated political discussions, but clearly um, other people do. All right. Um, so anyway, uh, I might have a little bit of Brazil's tech, uh, feelings right there about the politics. Um, punctuality and meetings. Okay. In Brazil, Meeting times are relaxed. They often start 10 to 15 minutes late. Okay, I know some of you students that ought to move to Brazil because you don't get here until 15 minutes late sometimes. But um, I'm one of those people that prompt. If it says 3 o'clock, we need to start. All right, dining. Meals are an important part of building relationships in Brazil. Don't touch your food with your hands. They'd have a hard time going to Kentucky Fried Chicken, wouldn't they? Yes. Or McDonald's in that case, okay? And you have a toast at the beginning of the meal. Uh, Brazil likes frequent touching. It's okay to shake hands, embrace each other, kiss on the cheeks, okay? You can touch arms, you can stand close to one another. How do y'all feel about that? Do you like touching or not? Some people, do, some people do, some people don't. Let's hear what you said. I'm sorry. I said I'm a hugger, so I have no problem with that. You're a hugger? Yes. Okay. Some people are. Some people are like, don't get anywhere near my space. Okay. Are you a kisser? Do you kiss your, do you kiss your friends on the cheek? Do you, do you greet people with a kiss? Okay. All right. Well, that's what they do in Brazil. Uh, Brazil Brazilians are also very expressive, um, you know, use their hands a lot when they talk. They're loud and so on. They have formal business attire. Uh, women, however, should be dressing femininely. <laughs> Don't use titles except in formal situations, and they do not give gifts on the first meeting. Better alternative is to buy a meal. Now, let's look at Russia. Russia, it's okay to talk about politics. It's okay to talk about history, current events, books, films, but do not talk about your personal life, religion, or do not compare Moscow and St. Petersburg, okay? Their meetings are scheduled far in advance, okay? Dining is often used to finish a deal and make sure the seating arrangements are appropriate. Hands always stay above the table. I don't know what you're doing if your hands are under the table, but uh, Russian, Russians don't like to see that. Drinking alcohol is an important part of socializing now i know some of y'all would like that yes okay all right um they don't touch each other except to greet like handshakes they have calm conversation styles they're philosophical so not this loud spontaneous stuff got a dress and brand name expensive suits <laughs> have to use people's titles uh, until you have this actually established a good relationship with them. And they love gifts, but not cheap gifts. They want the good stuff. 
dessert items, fine wine, nice chocolates. Okay. Now let's look at India. All right. Okay, to talk about your family and personal life, India likes to talk about cricket instead of soccer, uh, but not okay to talk about religion, Pakistan, poverty, slums, any of that sort of stuff. They schedule their meetings far in advance like the Russians do. Uh, meals are used to show hospitality. People stand closer to one another than they do here in the United States. If somebody were to get within two feet of me, that would be right there. I'd start probably backing away a little bit. I don't like people up in my space unless it happens to be like a relative or something. Well, I don't know if this has to do with the culture itself, but India is also extremely population dense. And I don't think that if you want to meet somebody in public, you want to be taking up too much of the sidewalk. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, India is, if you've never really looked at the um, Indian um, culture, that's something that you might find very interesting. So just Google it sometime. You know, what's life like in India? And you'll find some pretty interesting things. Um, they're very um, friendly in their conversation. Men wear suits and ties. Women wear what's called a saw war suit. Uh, they dress conservatively. They use titles. And they like gift giving as well. Expensive and leather gifts should be avoided though. So they don't want the good stuff. They want the cheap stuff. All right, how about China though? Okay, in China to talk about Chinese history, calligraphy, Chinese food, but stay away from talking about Taiwan, Tibet, Tiananmen Square, or human rights in general. You know, China has some real issues with human rights because that's where um, a lot of your goods that are produced are created in China and they use like child labor and um, that kind of stuff. And people get paid like a penny an hour, it's so bad. Um, be there on time. Um, they do have really fancy meals to build part of their relationship. Toasting is important. They don't really serve their meals, though. They serve them on a Lazy Susan, that little rotating thing in the center of the table. Handshakes and slight bows during greetings, but not much touching. Okay, so if you go to China, uh, avoid touching people. Uh, people commonly sit side by side rather than facing one another during a meeting. So you're not going to see the big conference table. What you're going to see is like rows of people. Uh, they're kind of cautious when it comes to conversation. Conservative suits don't wear anything bright colored and women don't wear high heels. Um, they do use titles and gift giving is very common. Uh, present your gift with two hands, okay, but don't make it something expensive. So very interesting little comments there about different uh, countries in the workplace there. Now we're going to uh, lead into a little bit with the age differences. Um, different identities can impact the way you communicate in the workplace. Of course, gender is one of those identities. Okay, but there are generational groups as well. And I'm sure you all have heard, like, are you a Gen X person? Are you a millennial? Are you a baby boomer like me? Uh, those are different generational groups and, and you identify with them. Here are some of the groups there. Uh, don't usually have anybody too much anymore that's a traditional in my classroom. Those are people born between 1925 and 1945. If you know any of those, they tend to think they are part of the greatest generation. That's what they call themselves, the greatest generation. 
Uh, boomers, that's me, okay, baby boomers, born between 46 and 64. Uh, that was when there was a huge population uh, growth taking place after World War II. Gen X, uh, first of all, I'm guessing I'm probably the only boomer in our class. Yeah. But if I'm not, somebody let me know. Do I have any Gen Xs in here? Yeah. All right. Born between 65 and 81. How about Gen Ys between 81 and 99? Yes. Yeah. yeah, we're getting there, okay? And then anybody born in 2000 or after? All right, you guys are your Gen Zs or your uh, millennials, okay? Um, so there are, there are identities attached to each one of these. Um, nowadays, you can have people in the workplace coming from all five of those generations. Okay, so you're going to have to work with people that come from different identities as far as age goes. You may be in the workplace and you may be a millennial and you're working with a baby boomer like me. Or you may even be still working with a traditional list. Um, so learning to work with different groups is important because each, I, each group has its own little identity. If you are working with people from different generations, uh, just take a look at them individually and their professional goals, because we are still going to have some similarities across the generations. But there are different approaches to communicating and very much different approaches on what you should wear and how formal you should be. All right, so here we go with three of those generations, the Boomers, the Gen X, and the Gen Y. All right, and this is a um, how millennials think about us, okay? So you Gen Z people, I had quite a few of you that were Gen Zs. Do you think that Baby boomers are tech savvy and that got a low ranking. So you think people like me don't know how to use computers and cell phones and things like that. But you think that Gen X does a much better job and Gen Y even better. You think I'm not a very adaptable person. Okay, you also think I'm not into diversity. I'm not enthusiastic. I'm not concerned about um, uh, wait a minute, entitled and concerned primary. Oh, okay, I'm not concerned about that promotion. I am up, getting up there at entrepreneurial, but not as much as the Gen X and Gen Ys. And I'm not a brand ambassador. I'm not the one that's going to, you know, pick a brand and then stick with it all along. Okay, so millennials have definite perceptions about baby boomers like me. They also have perception about Gen X and Gen Y um, and how they behave as well. So other generations judge us. All right, what about collaboration? Lacking relevant experience? Let's see, we do okay on the boomers do all right on relationship building but millennials think gen y people aren't very good at relationship building you also gen y folks are not very flexible you don't have very good communication skills gen y's are not hard working and they are not good decision makers okay so this is what millennials think of you though Okay, I think some of that comes from the fact that Gen Y is the where technology started taking over and uh, people didn't communicate with each other so much face to face. Um, so there are some things that definitely tend to be different there. All right, let me um, go to the video that I have on the age differences. <coughs> All 
Okay, this one has four generations in the workplace working together. Millennial Gen X Boomer Traditionist. It's like my kid. They forget the phone. It's like they're going to die. My phone doesn't leave like a six inch radius from me. They're like all these kids with their tech gadgets, you know? <laughs> all we have is newspapers and advocates. He just showed us the different generations because he couldn't remember. That is definitely my generation. I like that. I prefer a quick, right to the point answer, no back and forth email. I have a hard time adapting to sending emails. So sometimes my bosses get a little frustrated, but I don't want to talk. I check social media probably like 50 or 60 times a day. I mean, that's pretty serious, but yes, I would. The ones that are in Gen X and then the baby boomers, they are a little bit more don't want to be in the spotlight, where millennials like to be praised and they like that constant feedback. generations looking at the same problem. That's four different answers that may answer the same question, but in a different style. Now you have so many new things to learn, like let's move on to the next thing. It gave me a lot of thought into the different generations that work here. I mean, we need each other. So some interesting things there. Did um, would you all leave a job if your boss asked you to delete your Facebook page? Depends on the page. I was say depends on the job. Yeah. Depends on the job. Okay. Donald's like, yeah, I'd leave because. How how important is social media to you? Uh, we'll see. I view because. I'm a marketing student and I have ulterior motives for marketing um, other than like getting a job in business. Um, I view social media not so much as a place to talk to people and check up on people and see what they're doing, but I see it more as a branding tool to brand yourself to people that are hiring you to see. I'm a musician, so I have. I view it as a marketing tool for my band or for my music. Um, so that's kind of where I lie with social media. Uh, social media has become an extremely n good marketing tool. I mean, that uh, there are um, companies that have found that they have to have a Facebook page to continue to get customers to come in. And of course, there are many businesses that their sole uh, way of having clients and customers is through um, social media. But there are many companies now that don't even look at your resume unless you've published it on LinkedIn. Um, I know that um, Microsoft is one of those. Microsoft here um, will not even think about hiring you unless you have published your uh, resume on LinkedIn. There's other kinds of credentials and that kind of stuff that show up as well there. So let me see if I can find one video I want to show you guys because um, I think it's kind of hilarious. Okay, here it is. This is, um, let me share the screen for you here. Hold on. Let me 
This is a millennial. You are trained in technology. That's very good. Are you adept at Excel? No. This is oh, a millennial having no. a job interview. Publisher. Not really. Exactly in what area of technology are you proficient? <laughs> Snapchat, Pinterest, Instagram, Vine, Twitter. You know the big ones. I'm surprised you didn't say Facebook. <laughs> That's for old people, like my parents. <laughs> That's funny. Well, Amy, when you're working for me, you have to have those kind of tools <laughs> because I'll send you things for you to comb through and get the answers and send them to me. So for that, you've got to be really good at technology. For stuff like that, no problem. I'll just ask Siri. You're just ask Siri? You know, Siri, tell me this. Siri, find me that. We're all good getting you the answers. Tell Siri I want you ready to go at 8 sharp each and every morning. I don't understand. What do I understand? <laughs> what you just said. You don't understand. Be ready to go? No. You said 8, right? Yes. Eight like in the morning, eight? Yes, in the morning. Yeah. That kind of doesn't work for me. Who gets up at eight? I do. I Skype with my French boyfriend in Paris until like three in the morning. I don't even get to Starbucks until like 10 where I order my grande chai tea latte, three pumps, skin milk, white water, 2% foam, extra hot, but not too hot. So if it's okay, I work best in the morning at 10.45. <laughs> Wow. Amy, I don't think we're going to be a good fit. Why are you so negative? I can sense your hostilities, and right now I am not feeling very safe. I've been here for over five minutes, and the only nice thing you have said to me was nice resume, which I typed all night for this meeting with you. You've given me no guidance, no validation, no encouragement, no supervision. Is there an HR director somewhere? HR director? Yes. I need to speak to someone. I may have to take off today as a mental health day. Take today off you. Amy, Amy, look at me. You don't work here. Are you firing me? Yes. <laughs> That's the worst video I've ever seen in my life. That's not real. <laughs> it's an inaccurate representation of us. I I will be honest at that. Oops, let me get that off. Make sure your words are as professional as you. Grammarly helps you bring clear, effective writing that drives the results you want. Get that off of there. Okay, so what do y'all think? I got one vote over here for sure that that's an inaccurate representation. I, I, think, it, I think I got two. I think it is kind of inaccurate. I mean, it, it's somewhat accurate to some some of the people in the millennial generation, but yeah, it's, it's not all you know. All of us are, you know, it's, like, it's accurate to probably like two or three percent. Yes. Yeah. But oh, oh, okay, it only applies to a couple of you all. Yeah, I mean, I would um, say that it's a pretty good representation of what older generations think about millennials. Yeah. Okay. Um, but there are some like very spoiled, like kids of the pain and everything too that don't have the I will tell you one thing. If you ever came to a job interview with me and you sat there with your phone in front of you texting the whole time, you wouldn't get past 15 seconds with me. That is uncalled for in the workplace. And I do think that there are um, skills that the millennial generation has not developed when it comes to respect respect and protocol and that kind of stuff 
Uh, chances are, if you are interviewing with someone, you're going to be interviewing with someone who is not in your generation. Okay, so you need to be aware of that. Okay, and I will tell you that uh, when they talk about are you tech savvy, they are not asking if you know how to use Instagram. Um, they also are not going to appreciate the fact that you are not willing to be at the job at eight or nine in the morning. It's not going to happen. Okay. If you, if you don't want to do that, then you need to find a different type of job to be in. Okay. I'm trying to think what else they uh, brought up there that was interesting. Um, Oh, I mean, she automatically thought she was hired already and she's going to take a mental day, right? Uh, that was pretty funny. There are times when I feel like I need a mental day, but I'll be honest, I don't usually take them. So um, my, my students would have a fit if I just said, I'm not going to show up for class because I just, I can't handle this. You know? yes. um, but... There are generational differences is all I'm trying to say, but that video clearly said that if you bring everyone together, you can still gain from each other. Okay, You can really still gain from each other. So don't think your generation is better than others. I feel like it's all in how you were raised. Like, for most people, like, um, like you do have some millennial generation that is like that, but I feel like if you were... Well, like with me, I can tell myself like a lot of people tell me I have an old soul, but that's because like I was mostly raised by like older, like by the older generation. So my you know way of doing things and stuff may be a little bit different from the from generation, but also oh, absolutely, I agree with you that how you were brought up um, has a big impact, and if you were brought up by someone who had. A uh, little different views than another generation did. You probably will behave differently as well. Definitely agree with that. So no, I'm not trying to stereotype it. I'm not picking my finger and pointing it at one of you millennials and saying that's the way you're going to act. I'm just saying that's the stereotyped um, feeling that's going on about the millennial generation. Okay, I think maybe we have one or two more slides just to go through briefly and we will be done with today. Again, just know that differences do exist. I think y'all saw that in the, um, the video. Biological differences do exist in the way men and women communicate. Women do tend to be more relationship oriented, interconnected, where men are more independent and competitive and linear in their thinking. Uh, this just looks like the fact that gender differences do vary from country to country. Some uh, individualistic cultures versus um, the more collectivist cultures, women and men are perceived differently. Women do have speech patterns that ask questions, they apologize, they share credit, they give feedback, they avoid opposition. Um, they are indirect with their subordinates, but they are also complementary. Um, whereas men do behave differently in just their speech patterns. Um, professionals use speech patterns for task-based versus relationship-based reasons. So uh, you need to adopt your own style and overcome any biases you have. Um, you want to exhibit your cultural intelligence with other groups. You want to make sure you understand that those groups could be simply that you are from a different region. We talked about the, the north versus the south in the United States, whether you're urban, suburban, rural, um, ethnic, occupational groups. Companies themselves even have uh, different cultures. So in this chapter, which is one of my favorite chapters, I have to say, um, we did talk about what cultural intelligence was. We talked about different types of dimensions in culture. We talked about business etiquette in different countries. And we talked about how group differences can affect your workplace. 
So I hope you found this chapter pretty, pretty interesting as well. Okay, now, we need to talk about what's going to happen next week. Okay, it is test time next week. Um, the test is um, through the same type of um, work that you've been doing the homework through. It's through that connect system. Okay, so it is on the computer. Um, I know some of my classrooms do not have computers. Um, the Keysville campus and I don't, Christiana in Alberta, y'all don't have computers in that classroom, do you? No. Okay, you two are probably going to um, have to go to your learning resource centers or your library and use computers um, to get this done. Um, I can actually come in Thursday for this classroom and y'all can take the test here in, in um, South Boston. But I'm, what I'm going to do is say that the Keysville and Alberta campuses need to find um, computers to actually take the test on. Uh, we're going to have all week next week to take the test, okay? But I'd like the, the South Boston group to come in here and take it in class here. <laughs> Uh, I really would like to have the other two campuses finish theirs up by Thursday, too. It would be much more um, equal from the, from the different campuses. So, um, again, what you want to do is get access to a computer. Make sure you know how to sign on to the computer, get into Canvas, get into Connect, just like you've done your homework in. The test is um, multiple choice questions. Uh, you may use your textbook, you may use your PowerPoint notes and any other kinds of notes that you've taken, uh, but you cannot go out of the test once you start it, which means you have to have any kind of notes and that kind of stuff right there in your hand. You can't jump out of the test and go look at PowerPoint that's on the computer. You got to have those with you. So if you haven't, uh, gotten copies of those chapters, you need to print them out before you take your test so you can have access to them. Um, so we will Tuesday not actually meet, okay? We will not meet Tuesday. I'm gonna let the, um, the Keysville campus and the Alberta campus, you can use Tuesday Wednesday and Thursday to take the test, but you've got to find a computer to take it on. Hey, Miss Anderson. Yes. These these computers have to be at school. We can't do this like homework at home. Um, I prefer that you use the school. Okay. Um, but that's primarily because I just need to make sure that you are the actual one taking the test. Okay, and in the in the computer labs and the schools and so on, you have to actually sign in. Yeah, look, one more one more question is under the um, like it's a, um, I don't know what they call it, but it's something in South Hill for this school. With, it's, yeah, it's not really the school or nothing, but they got computers. Would it be okay if I just went there? Where where would that be? It's in South Hill. Oh sure, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I but, just I need I need some assurance that you are the actual one taking the test. So I need you to be somewhere where you're identified before you actually take it. Well nobody else can walk into our south side but us. <laughs> well, I know, but when you sit down on a computer yeah. You know, you, you need to be the one logging in on the computer, not someone else. Okay, I don't want your, your friend who has already gotten through this class once before taking it for you. All right. 
All right, so I will be here on Thursday for the South Boston people. Y'all need to be here. Okay. Um, Keysville folks, I'll probably be around Tuesday if you want me to, to oversee anything that you're doing in the library or the learning commons, I'll be glad to help you out Tuesday. Um, otherwise, I will take a look for the grades on um, next week and hope, please get them done as fast as you possibly can if you have alternatives. Don't wait until Sunday night. Ms. Anderson. Yes. This is on um, James in Alberta. I got a question. As far as for, um, is there any way the modules from the first one can be reopened considering that I had just done my commitment, right? Well, back to where I can um, do assignments? Um, not really because the answers are already out there. You can, um, I don't think I can really have redos done because they're, the answers were released once the, they were submitted. So, okay. um, just if we get down to the end of the class and let's say you are just very close to one letter grade versus another, just remind me of what happened, okay? Okay. All right. All right. All right, thank you. All right, I will see you, some of you next Thursday. Others have a chore to get done. Thank you.